A new Roman emperor was just discovered. His name was Spontian, and he saved the empire from an invasion of a million barbarians. Or at least, that's what the deluge of news headlines and historical memes tell me. But what do we really know about this new emperor? And is he really even new? Or an emperor? Let's find out. The geopolitical rise and fall of nations in antiquity is fascinating to study, especially when considering the impact of technological developments such as new siege engines, warships, and more. But now you can take part in this action through our sponsor Rise of Kingdoms. It's a real-time strategy game featuring 13 diverse civilizations including Rome, Britain, Japan, the Vikings, and many more. Each has their own unique bonuses, architecture, and units led by legendary commanders. In Rise of Kingdoms, you build cities, form alliances, explore new lands, and battle for control of the kingdom. Progress your own way along a real-world tech tree to unlock and upgrade your soldiers with items like stirrups for cavalry or pavice shields for archers. When it comes time for battle, the experience happens in real time on the map, so you'll want to carefully pick your leaders, organize your armies, and coordinate your movements with allies. This might occur across the massive world map, featuring thousands of players and NPCs, or in battle zones such as the 30 vs 30 Ark of Osiris. In either case, crossplay between mobile and PC now lets you play how you want. So support my channel by downloading Rise of Kingdoms from the link or QR code and receive a special bonus using code ROKTECHPOW. Remember, technology is power, so build your powerful kingdom in Rise of Kingdoms. So where did all this hubbub even begin? Well, back in the early 1700s, a man by the name of Carl Gustavus Herreus came into the employ of the Holy Roman Empire to manage and expand their imperial coin and metals collection. In this regard, he appears to have worked with various entities to gather any existing and new items he could get his hands on. Such networking bore fruit when in March of 1713, he recorded a note of having acquired eight gold coins which were allegedly found as part of a newly discovered coin hoard in Transylvania. It is believed that this was but a portion of the entire set and more than a dozen other coins have been traced back to the original hoard based on their similar features and dates of discovery. Here is a diagrammatic representation of how modern researchers have pieced together the provenance of the so-called wider assemblage. Each circle represents a coin, with colors denoting their type, and their internal number representing that coin's place within each set of types. As you can tell, it's quite messy work trying to understand the history of these coins since their discovery. For now, let's ignore any questions of authenticity and summarize what is even found within this wider assemblage. Please note that not all of these coins can be accounted for today, and only a portion of them have to do with our new emperor. Anyways, researchers break them into seven types. The type 1 coin is a gold Macedonian stotter from the period of Alexander the Great, while the rest are from the Roman era. The most common of these are the 11 gold coins depicting Emperor Philip the Arab, and the 8 gold coins depicting Emperor Gordian III. There are six of the type 2 coins, which are gold versions of a late Republican silver denarius, and finally, there is one silver Type 7 coin, once again depicting Emperor Gordian III. Altogether, these are quite the valuable find. However, the remaining two types are the most amazing. They consist of six gold and one silver coins which bear the image of a man hailed as Imperator Sponsiani, who does not otherwise appear in our historical records. At the time of their discovery in the 1700s, this prompted quite an academic stir, as it was believed this proved the existence of a yet unknown Roman Emperor. Over the following decades, the hoard of coins would find itself dispersed among various individuals, groups, and institutions. Here, they would be further studied by numismatists and other researchers. Soon enough, early specialists began to cast doubts on their authenticity. It was apparent that the wider assemblage featured peculiar worksmanship, such as high variability in weights and an odd mixing of republican and imperial elements. For a time, this was chalked up to the coins as having been authentic, but barbarous imitations of true Roman coins which were frequently produced on the fringes of the empire. However, in 1868, a leading expert, Henry Cohen, laid out a damning case for the dubiousness of the Sponsian coins, declaring them as quote, ridiculously imagined and poorly made modern fakes. Soon, many of his peers also agreed, and the consensus shifted away from their authenticity. We can now summarize the major points of objection they raise regarding the Sponsian coins. It is cast from molds, rather than having been struck, which was the norm at the time. The weight is different than the typical double aureus from the period. The mineral composition includes higher than usual copper impurities. 
The face of the coin has an odd legend. For starters, it occupies only half of the coin, while most from that same period wrap around the majority of the border. Furthermore, the text of the legend reads Imp Sponsiani, which is the genitive case, literally meaning Imperator of Sponsian, rather than the standard nominative, which reads more grammatically. This bears the marks of someone unfamiliar with Latin or more familiar with customs of Greek coinage. The reverse is a copy of a Republican design from 400 years prior, which is unlikely to have been in circulation for reference at the supposed time of the coin's manufacture. What's even more suspicious is that while the text here says C-A-U-G, which would have easily been interpreted as bearing the name of the vaunted Caesar Augustus, in reality it denoted the far less renowned Republican moneyer C. Minucius Agrinus of the 2nd century BC. An odd choice indeed. And finally, if Sponsian and his coins were real, then where are the other pieces of evidence that might back up their claims to the legitimacy? After all, the historicity of Emperor Domitian II was confirmed in this manner despite similar levels of doubt. Taken together, these and other points went a long way in casting doubt on the authenticity of the supposed new emperor. It appears that this skepticism was well warranted. After all, there had been a growing number of imitations and forgeries which were found to have been flooding the coin market at the time. Over the years, the sophistication of such fakes had only increased, fooling many an unwary antiquarian and casting doubt on the whole field. A quick sidebar on this phenomenon. Fake coins have existed since the Roman era. There was always profit to be made in counterfeiting the products from the official mints, and this only intensified in times of widespread economic upheaval. This practice even extended beyond the traditional borders of the Roman Empire, where their coinage was still used as a form of currency. For instance, researchers have recently uncovered several workshops of the first century in modern Ukraine which were used to produce fake denarii of slightly reduced weight. Following the fall of the Roman Empire, different forms of currency came into use. However, there was still value in Roman coins when it came to collectors. Thus, we see evidence of imitations and forgeries ramping up once more during the Renaissance period. Famously, the Italian engraver Giovanni di Cavino made a huge number of Greek and Roman coins in the late 1500s. While the initial intent may not have been to trick people, it is known that these coins would be bought and sold over the years as if they were real. Others of his era were less scrupulous, and we have evidence of entire workshops being set up to scam wealthy collectors. Often, such fakes used real coins to make a mold, and then cast vast numbers of copies. These could be detected through close study, and in particular, the lack of an oxidized patina layer at the surface. In response, forgers developed methods of wearing down fakes and treating their surfaces with heat or various materials to make them look just right. Thus, the centuries have seen an arms race between the ability to fake coins and the ability to detect them. In this context, it's easy to see how many blew off the Sponsian coins. That is, until now. Over the pandemic, Professor Paul Pearson of University College London decided to write a history book on the crisis of the 3rd century, which similarly dealt with widespread upheaval in the face of disease and other crises. As a part of these studies, he came across the story of the fake Emperor Sponsian we previously described. Suspecting that the case might benefit from modern investigation, Professor Pearson tracked down one of the coins to the Hunterian Museum at Glasgow University. From here, he worked with researchers to conduct an analysis on their four coins, which could be traced back to the original 1713 hoard discovery, in addition to two genuine gold coins from the same period. This entire study was published on November 23rd of 2022 in a research article I have linked below, which you can read for yourself. In it, they lay out their methods of study, which involved visible light microscope and ultraviolet imaging, scanning electron microscopy, and finally, reflection mode Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. These tools were in turn used to analyze the coin's composition, manufacture, wear, and superficial deposits. I suggest reading their synthesis and interpretation to gain a better understanding of their findings, but for now, I will simply read you their summary passage on authenticity. Quote, In principle, the Sponsian group coins could have been manufactured at any time between the ascension of Emperor Philip in 244 CE and the first historical record of their existence in 1713. We must, however, allow time for the wear and burial described above. We are unable to devise any remotely plausible scenario that can account for the wear patterns overlain by cemented earthen deposits, other than that they are products of antiquity. The previous consensus among coin specialists that they are faked in the 18th century is clearly untenable. Authenticity is supported by other circumstantial arguments. That, as we have shown, the find was reported in 1713 by Johann David von Palm 
the senior finance minister responsible for metals and mines, who must have been sufficiently satisfied with the circumstances of their discovery to regard the coins as genuine and suitable for inclusion in the imperial cabinet. That the various types of coin were made from compositionally distinct batches of metal, that the subject matter of mixed republican and imperial types is an unlikely one for an 18th century fraudster with no remotely similar case being known, and that the rare and peculiar name Sponsian is genuinely Roman, although that could not have been known at the time. As such, we conclude that they comprise a unique category of ancient coin, heavy cast gold medallions of highly anomalous design that are neither barbarous nor counterfeit. Their main significance would appear to be that Sponsian should be rehabilitated as a historical personage. Nothing can be known about him for certain, but the coins themselves, together with the providence recorded by Horaeus, provide clues as to his possible place in history. So basically, new emperor confirmed. At least if you go by the headlines that exploded across the historical interwebs in December. I even caught wind of this news thanks to the deluge of Sponsian posts that flooded the Rough Roman subreddit. They were honestly amazing, but like the clickbaity news articles, offered little insight into what was actually being claimed. It's at this point that I want to point out that the conclusions of Paul Pearson and the research team are not without dispute. After all, the data set they're dealing with is quite small, and given the limited nature of research in this field, it is very hard to definitively prove that any observed characteristics of the coin necessarily point to any one conclusion about their cause. Especially because we know so little about the history of the coins prior to their discovery in 1713, or their chain of custody since then, and we are therefore left with a huge number of unknown events that might have contaminated our findings today. Even if the Sponsian coins can conclusively be dated back to at least 1713 as the team states, we can't rule out the idea that they are simply ancient fakes. Unfortunately, this is a case where we can't yet jump to conclusions. Researchers need more time to conduct additional testing, to broaden their dataset, and to draw in new lines of evidence before we can get a good idea of what's going on. I hope that I'll be able to report back on such efforts in the near future. For now though, let's entertain the idea that the coins are real, and do point to the existence of a lost emperor. I will now summarize the hypothesis put forth by the very team responsible for the study. They begin by stating that, quote, Sponsian never controlled an official mint and was unrecorded by all later historians, so he certainly did not rule in Rome. Thus we see that many headlines about their findings can be quite sensational and misleading. The team then goes on to hypothesize that while earlier writers considered Sponsian a usurper who likely rebelled around 248 AD during the last years of Emperor Philip's reign when other short-lived rebellions occurred, they believe it is more likely that he arose a decade later during the reign of Emperor Gallienus when large portions of the empire broke off. This would place the event shortly after the critical battle of Abritus in 251 AD which saw the Goths destroy three Roman legions along with the emperor and his son opening the floodgates for further barbarian invasion. The article states, quote, We suggest that Dacia became cut off from the imperial center around 260 and effectively seceded under its own military regime, which initially coined precious metal bullion using old Republican-era designs, then using the names of the most recent previous emperors who had achieved some success in the area, and finally under the name of a local commander-in-chief. The idea here being that Sponsian was not necessarily a usurper who took the first opportunity to cut and run with a province, but more of a leader thrust into the position of taking control of an area that was otherwise left to the wolves. They go on to discuss how this new ruler may have ordered the minting of new coins to sustain his region using the atypical methods of local craftsmen while bringing in various supportive claims to best fit a narrative for what their material analysis says about the conditions of the coins. They then conclude with the following. Quote, the scenario may also explain an apparent contradiction in the historical sources that has long puzzled historians. These say, on the one hand, that the province of Dacia was lost to the empire in the reign of Gallienus, but also that it was Aurelian who evacuated the peoples and soldiers to a new province, which he called Dacia for propaganda purposes, south of the Danube, formed out of the depopulated areas that had previously been part of the provinces of Upper and Lower Moesia, and a district further south known as Dardania. It has therefore been suggested that Dacia may have been abandoned in two stages. But a simpler way of reconciling these statements is to envisage an initial period of isolated secession when supply lines were cut off, followed by a negotiated and orderly withdrawal across the river when the security situation improved. 
Altogether, I have to admit, it's a really interesting story, but one which for now will be difficult to prove. While we may not have answers for a while, I hope you have found the process of understanding how such historical discoveries are made and what analysis looks like and how this gets spun by the media in all kinds of ways. If you're interested in learning more, I highly recommend that you have a read through the research article itself. You can also check out our episode on Roman inflation, which introduces you to the history of Roman coinage. If you enjoy our content, be sure to like and subscribe for more videos and check out these related episodes. See you in the next one.